Good evening, Los Angeles. For more than a month now, you've had me inside your homes, as each night I have updated you on the work that we are doing to fight for the soul of this city. The collective march forward that each one of us and our neighborhoods and our families and our communities are undertaking to save lives, to not only have this moment of retrenching so that we can be safe, but looking forward to how we will reopen and one day reimagine this city. I want to thank you for all that you are doing as always. The lifeblood of this city doesn't flow through places like City Hall or a Hall of Administration. It flows through our neighborhoods and through our people. And by that measure, Los Angeles is an incredibly strong city. I shared last night the state of our city. And while I did say that we are strong and remain ready to fight this crisis, I said we're also at home and we're bent, we're grieving, but we are not broken. That we have the ability to reimagine a moment in which we will once again rise and fly in this city of angels. We will get through this together, my friends, and we will get through it because of our spirit. So let me turn to today's data and update you on the information you need to know today. Today, the county reported 1,490 one new cases in Los Angeles County. That brings the total confirmed COVID-19 positive cases to 13,816, a 12% increase since yesterday. But that is by far the largest number we've seen, more than double our previous peak of 711 new cases on April 4th. But it's important to note that that was probably because a backlog of cases, a new laboratory that came online, and a lot of results that came in one day not necessarily a single day surge, but just a reporting surge of today. For comparison, the past seven days, we've seen an average daily increase of 654 new cases, still a large number, and one that we should expect to keep seeing in the days ahead. In the city of Los Angeles, those cases were 716 new cases today, bringing the total to 6,224, a nearly 13% increase since yesterday. And today, many of you followed the antibody test uh, conducted by USC and LA County that we've been involved with. I brought the doctors last week to this briefing, Dr. Simon and Sood. They shared the first results of the first wave of antibody studies to see what the prevalence of COVID-19 in the general population was by testing for the antibodies that we generate in reaction to COVID-19. And it showed that the rate of COVID-19 infections far exceeds the number of confirmed cases, something that we knew, but now we're starting to get data for. It also points towards that only a small percentage of adults in the county have antibodies to COVID-19. The number they came up with in the initial study was that 4.1% of the adult population in LA County from this sample, but it was a representative sample, are COVID-19 positive or have been COVID-19 positive. That would mean that our mortality rate, which we've been measuring at about 4.5%, would be much lower. It would mean many more people have been exposed to the COVID-19 virus. But it would also mean that still more than 95% of us, if this study is representative, still do not have that, do not have any potential immunity, and are still vulnerable to being able to catch this disease and die from it. Today, we learned of 17 new deaths countywide. This brings our total to 617 deaths. And each night, it's simple to just say numbers and to forget with a steady drumbeat that these are human lives of our loved ones. But we must never know those connections and how important these people have been to us, no matter who they are, whether it's a friend or a family member, a colleague, or somebody who lives in our neighborhood. We mourn with you, all families, who tonight have lost a loved one. This was a 3% increase in deaths since yesterday. And for comparison, the past seven days, we're seeing an average daily increase of 43 new deaths. So deaths are doubling every seven days. This weekend, we learned that in America, COVID-19 is now the leading cause of death in the United States. The virus has killed more than 1,800 Americans almost every day since April 7th. That's ahead of heart disease, that's ahead of cancer, 
And we all know people who have died of heart disease and of cancer. So let's do everything that we can to stop COVID-19 in its tracks before we see even more loved ones taken by this deadly disease. The death toll would be far worse were it not for the heroic work that we're seeing from our doctors, our nurses, our janitorial and support staff at our hospitals. We're doing everything to ensure that they have the resources they need and are not met by a crushing and dangerous surge in patients. Thank you for protecting them as they protect us. So good news again across our county and our general emergency hospitals. Yesterday we had 1,573 beds available, including 1,301 for acute care and 272 intensive care unit beds, an inventory of 1,040 available ventilators. We're looking to keep Angelinos healthy though, to stay safe and out of those hospital beds. And testing helps us do just that. So let me update you on testing. Now in 33 testing locations across the county, three locations open today, including one at the Good Samaritan Hospital where I was born in Westlake. And today we have the capacity to test 12,000 people a day. It's a remarkable statistic and one of the leading ones in the country. And by the end of today, we will have tested through these centers approximately 80,000 people. Add the private labs and our public uh, labs as well. We have now tested more than 100,000 people in Los Angeles County. Each day, we're conducting more than a third of all tests that are done across the state. And each day, we have the capacity to test twice as many people. We are offering same or next day appointments to remind everybody who has any symptoms. So get tested coronavirus.lacity.org slash testing. For families, remember, each family member, if you have symptoms, should fill out your own appointment, but get a test today. And help us know who is out there, who is positive. As we saw from our serology test, many more people have that. So even if it's mild symptoms and you think you got this, please take a test. It helps us and it helps protect all of your loved ones as well. Each night at this briefing, I have shared that this crisis has been so hard, not just on the lost lives, but also on the li lost livelihoods. And everybody in Los Angeles can feel that. COVID-19's devastating economic impact extends also to our city's budget, which I released today. Our budget year is kind of different than the calendar year. It starts July 1st and ends on June 30th. And this time of the year, by our city charter, I release a budget to plan for those 12 months that start on July 1st. I usually say that budgets are a statement of our values, but as I shared last night, this is also a document of our pain. Hard times are ahead, harder than what we saw in 2008. Revenues are down across the board, transient occupancy tax, a fancy way to say hotel tax, sales tax, parking tax, utility users tax will all be hit especially hard. And there will be cuts. Los Angeles reacted swiftly to COVID-19, and that quick response also extended to our budget. I immediately implemented a hiring freeze, stopped any new programs in any of our departments, and now that hiring freeze will be extended into this next fiscal year. And I directed department heads to make some tough decisions about the hard but necessary cuts ahead. And over the course of the next fiscal year, most of our civilian employees myself and my staff included, will incorporate a reduced work schedule resulting in a 10% reduction in pay. Even as I have declared, though, a state of fiscal emergency, we will not compromise on those things that you depend on government delivering. We will not compromise on our response to COVID-19, not one fewer test, not one fewer worker helping those who are unhoused get indoors, not one fewer paramedic getting you to the hospital when you need to be delivered. We will not compromise in our fights to make sure that this extends to everyone, whether it's folks that are living in Skid Row through emergency shelters and bridge home transitional housing, project room key hotel and motel rooms, all while we expand health and hygiene on our streets. And we will not compromise our commitment to your public safety through our police officers and firefighters who are on the front line during this crisis. And we can keep doing what we can to ensure that we make it easier for those folks who are most hardly hard hit by this, so that folks can make rent and businesses can stay afloat or reopen in the days ahead. Let me be clear, 
back to basic investments that keep our neighborhoods safe, that keep our streets clean, that keep our families housed, that keep our children and our seniors fed, these are not open for compromise or cut. Coming into this crisis, too, I want to thank our city council and my team for the work that we did for seven years to build up a reserve fund. As I said last night, you win no awards for it, you get no headlines, but we built up a reserve fund that's twice as strong today as the city was before the 2008 Great Recession. That means that while we have to make cuts everywhere, no program will be completely cut, but all programs will receive some cuts. The proposed budget I've put forward anticipates that the economic impacts of COVID-19 continue into not just this year, but future years. And it's imperative that we do not dip into existing reserves to avoid greater sacrifices in the future. And it also points out what I said last night, that our federal government needs to step up and help our st states and help our cities, just as they've helped big corporations. Our city, like so many others across the country, in worse positions, need that federal support, not just to cover costs, but shortfalls so cities don't default on debt, so workers can keep their jobs, so that infrastructure can continue to be built, so that our recovery comes back stronger and swifter than it otherwise would. And I'm grateful to our federal partners for agreeing to cover some of the costs that we are incurring in COVID-19. We can build some of those back and get some of the money that we're fronting for things like testing and shelters. But now, Congress must pass what was put forward by Speaker Pelosi and Minority Leader Schumer to put $150 billion for states and local government. And this is not a partisan issue. In red and blue and purple states and cities, we are all suffering. And I've had very good, hopeful conversations with the Speaker and our congressional delegation as we work to loosen restrictions on emergency funds. I hope it can be part of this package that is being negotiated now but no later than the next big package. We need to make sure those dollars flow. And members of Congress who are still holding out and taking our states and cities and holding them hostage, don't let America's states and cities die. Step up and bail out America as you're bailing out American corporations too. Working together, we can get through this crisis. That's the spirit that we have engaged since the beginning of this. And there's so many people behind me and aside me and in front of me. And so many of those people are you watching tonight. You know your leadership within your own family or maybe your school community. Maybe it's your neighborhood or your workplace. But you are stepping up as leaders, not passive and powerless, but strong, active, and powerful in this crisis. LA County needs your help. And one of the places that has guided our philanthropic work and other work is making sure we look at those who need help the most. LA County is home to more than a million individuals living with disabilities. And this crisis has shined a bright light on the significant needs of this community. 26% of folks living with disabilities in our county also live in poverty. And more than 40% live in households that are food insecure. It's a staggering number. So while this pandemic has strained all of us, our neighbors with disabilities are among the most vulnerable and we need to meet their needs now. And help is on the way. And I'm very pleased to announce a new partnership with Fox to provide free meals to individuals with disabilities across our city. We all know the historic Fox lot and the history in building our city and Century City up. But thanks to what was then out of work folks that used to provide meals to hardworking blue collar workers in our film and television industry. We're putting them back to work, thanks to Fox, and delivering 2,000 meals five days a week for the next month to serve folks who are facing new barriers accessing food during this emergency period. The Fox food service team will prepare meals on the Fox lot on the west side and deliver them to a hub at one of our public library branches where then drivers from our access services will pick them up and bring them directly to people who need them. And to ensure we're reaching the right individuals and families, our Department on Disability has partnered with the California Department of Rehabilitation and 20 community-based organizations that already serve individuals living with disabilities across LA to identify people who will benefit the most. And in the weeks and months to come, 
The city will continue to build on this with more meals, more grocery delivery services as part of our larger effort to make sure that we address food insecurity among people who are living with disabilities. And so thank you to the great team at Fox here in LA. I saw some awesome photos of everybody from the studio chefs and workers all the way to the CEO, Lachlan Murdoch, coming together to load those meals up and to get them to people in need. And we're so grateful to everyone in this city and in the city family especially who stepped up, including Stephen Simon and his team at the Department on Disability and city librarian John Zabo for opening up vital space to this effort. Thank you to you and your teams. When we talk about our budget, we're focused on the basics of city government that we depend on in a crisis like this and every other day. It's how we'll keep the lights on, the water flowing, the streets clean, and everyone safe. When we talk about delivering meals to folks with disabilities, we're focused on the basic service to the most vulnerable. And when we talk about what's happening in Los Angeles right now, we see how this crisis is bringing out the most basic features of our common humanity, our generosity, our compassion, our willingness to lend a hand, to not see the differences between us, but to find the common ground. We see this in Susan Sanders and Andrew Whitmer in Valley Glen, who've gone door to door to find out what people need and then organize volunteers to pick up medicine, food, and other necessities for seniors who, and those who can't leave their homes. Thank you, Andrew and Susan. We see it in efforts of Chica's Mom, Inc., a nonprofit in the Northeast San Fernando Valley that's been handing out meals to the vulnerable and started delivering meals to residents and doctors at the Olive View Hospital in Silmar on Good Friday and they promise to keep it going every week. Thank you. We see it in LAPD officer Esteban Cifuentes, who's collected box loads of apples and oranges and bananas, juice boxes and fruit cups for seniors living in the Imperial Court's public housing development. And we're seeing it in the coalition of the Peace Chapel Church, the Rebuild California Alliance, and the Community Health Councils in South LA, who set out to provide food for a few people in their neighborhood for two weeks, but thanks to donations and support from the communities, they're now providing 250 meals each night to fill the gap for families in deepest need. These aren't isolated incidents. They're a reflection of the city. These are the examples of extraordinary kindness that are sweeping across LA. Reminders that every small act actually makes a big difference. These stories show what it means to lead with LA love. And I wanna thank you all for being a part of this recovery. So I'm gonna to keep tonight brief and answer questions, but as I always say, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay at home. Love and strength, Los Angeles. With that, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Our first question comes from the line of Claudia Ashuda with KNX News Radio. Please go ahead. Hi, Claudia. Hey, a um, couple of questions. Sure. So, um, with the uh, furloughs being faced by thousands of city workers, I'm wondering if those who are reassigned to certain essential positions, say, like working at one of the emergency shelters at a rec center, if they would be exempted from that. The second question is, you know, given efforts to ramp up testing, if, uh, if we'll start seeing testing of asymptomatic residents and staffers at nursing homes, given the high number of deaths that we're seeing in these facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I'm, as I said early on in these briefings, I was very concerned about nursing homes. Um, I know that the LA County Public Health had a team just on that at the beginning, and I talked with Bar uh, Dr. Barbara Ferrer, who was here this morning, and we talked about this because we want to help her in any way that we can. We stood up these strike teams that have gone already into nursing homes to help people when they've contacted us and announced that website that folks can go to to sign folks up. I know a lot of family members went there, but we need to have the, um, you need to have somebody at your loved one's senior home facility sign up for it because we need their permission to go in there. But already we've gone to you know over a dozen places and we need to really go all of them because this is the place where the most vulnerable and the highest number of deaths nationally, we saw it from Seattle in the beginning, are. So I do want to see us get more tests in there. I talked with my team about it. I hope in the next couple of days we're gonna develop a plan together with the county and see how we can get more tests into our nursing homes. But it also lays something out 
The reason why it's spreading is not just that there's seniors and people living close together, is that we have a lot of folks in some senior homes that are not paid well. Uh, folks who don't want to pay overtime, allow people to only have one shift. So it requires a lot of these workers are in two or three different places. And that can lead to spread when workers go between one and another place. So I hope coming out of this smarter and stronger, we can also look at making sure that those workers are well represented, that they are paid for their work, and that they are protected as well, so they don't become among the most vulnerable, as well, of course, as the loved ones of ours that they care for. So absolutely. Um, in terms of ramping up testing to, the not, to folks without symptoms, not yet. That's not yet the recommendation from uh, County Public Health. If we have enough capacity, we may look at that. And we may look at it in a way that can take a sample. So we can see a sample of the blood test, like I just announced the USC study did, and also compare that to a sample of uh, the virology test. So we can see not only who has had it, but who does have it in a random sampling. Because you need to know not just who has had it and maybe is no longer uh, infectious, but how many people are infectious at any given time. For me, doing that is as critical, the decisions about opening up, even more critical than the blood tests. So when people are talking nationally, we can't open up until we have more tests. They're right, but many of them are saying it in the wrong way. It's not more blood tests, um, because right now it's not the recommendation for many public health officials I've talked to take a blood test and show that you're immune and go to work. It's more to know what level of infection do you have right now today? And that will come from random sampling of virology tests. We may be getting close there, but again, we want everybody with symptoms to get tested first. And if we build that capacity, absolutely. In terms of the essential positions and whether they would be furloughed, um, that is something that we are open to making sure if they are critical positions that they would be able to work um, all 10 days of a pay period instead of nine. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, next question. Next question comes from the line of Mary Beth McDade. Please go ahead. With the TLA Channel 5. Hi, Mary Beth. Great, thanks. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Yes, a couple things. Wondering, um, based on that USC County study that you were referencing with the antibodies, wondering what then is the mortality rate? I know you said it's much lower than the four point something that it was originally thought. So what is the mortality rate now? And with it being so low, how will this impact starting to ease restrictions and reopening the economy. Mm -hmm. And then just lastly, I know you said you didn't want to be using the reserve fund that you had built up. I guess I just don't understand why not use it. I mean, wouldn't right. a world pandemic be the perfect time to use that reserve fund? Oh, let me be clear. Uh, I, I meant further. We have already taken it from what was about a 7 or 8% reserve fund down to what was right now about 3.45%. But you need to have a basic amount before suddenly your debt and everything that you have costs you even more. You know, in other words, you could spend $50 million more and get downgraded and that could cost you $100 million. So we're balancing those two things. I meant just no further. Absolutely, it is precisely because we have that reserve fund that we are dipping into it in the hundreds of millions, already 70 million that we put forward to get the testing done and other things. So we will use that but we can't go down to zero on the reserve fund before you really risk the city kind of toppling into an area that would cost much more than even the money that you're spending. Um, in terms of the county, I'm not gonna calculate that rate. Um, I'm gonna wait for the USC folks who say they want some time because you need to wait a couple more weeks to take the moment in time when we are calculating the number of people who were carrying COVID-19 related antibodies to seeing the number of deaths that can come in that three or four week period. So you can't take the snapshot of deaths today. Um, so it will be higher than if you calculate it today, but lower than the four or 5%. But let me be clear, even with a lower death rate, so we'll see what happens. I don't think that New York or Los Angeles or other places are gonna be radically different. In New York, there's been as many deaths, more deaths per capita as we have cases. So if we relax too much and just say, oh, this, this disease doesn't kill, look at the evidence. In a city like New York, in other places where we've seen it skyrocket, we cannot be complacent. So I think all of us are looking at the ways we widen that aperture slowly. I talked with Dr. Ferrer about that. I think that's something in coming weeks you'll begin to see in very small ways moving forward. But if we relaxed everything, we would see 95% infection by August 1st, according to one projection. That would mean 950,000 people. And even if you had a low death rate, that is thousands and thousands of deaths. 
So we have to be very clear about making sure that we listen to our public health professionals about how and when we open that up. And I want to reassure everybody watching, uh, this is what we are spending so much time on right now, talking to those experts, waiting for those moments, and that will be guided by county public health, not by kind of a political feeling, uh, not by a protest, not by folks saying, hey, we have to stay in, or other people saying we should all go out. It really should be done looking at that evidence and that advice, and that is my promise to the people of LA, that medicine and facts will guide this. Thank you. Next question. Our next question comes from the line of David Sennheiser with Los Angeles Times. Hi, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, Dave. Hey, so we've been hearing a lot about the hit to the city budget from diminished tax revenues, but another big challenge in the coming budget year is a series of employee pay raises at City Hall. You know, police officers are on track to get about two raises, totaling about 4.75%. Firefighters are due to get the same in July. Civilian city unions are scheduled to receive two 2% raises. So I'm wondering, have you gone to these unions and asked them to postpone those pay increases until a year when there's not a global health crisis? And if you aren't, um, are there things you are trying to renegotiate in these employee salary contracts? No, right now we've had to balance the budget short of that. So furloughs, which are actually deeper and provide much more savings, once you take out of the general fund, uh, the amount that those raises are, it still wouldn't be enough, even if those raises didn't happen to balance our budget. Um, so doing the furloughs is something that allows us to actually have even more savings this year. And so that's why we had to go to something more extreme. I do look forward to sitting down and continuing. As people know, those are things that have to be negotiated and mutually agreed upon. And I wouldn't take anything off the table. If our unions come to us and say, hey, we'd rather do this than that, we are absolutely open. But, you know, the heroic work that's being done by our city workforce on the front lines, we want to be sensitive to what their rights are in those negotiations and ensure that we have enough to balance the budget. Even if we gave away those raises uh, to our civilian workforce, it would not be enough. And the folks that are out there on the front lines who are not being furloughed are only those most essential people. So, again, we'll sit down, talk to anybody. And as I said, my priority is to rebuild those, that reserve fund back up so that we don't lose even more money. And then right after that, after our COVID-19 expenses and the reserve fund, is to see if we can reduce those furloughs. But that will really depend on whether our federal government steps up and allows us to move forward. If they step up and help us, not just us, but every city in America and every state in America, then we can keep people employed. We can keep them spending on Main Street. We can keep them supporting their families. And you know that, to me, is the most critical thing. If we have to see that and it gets worse and we see revenues go down further, um, there may be further cuts and there may be even deeper things that we have to do with our city services and our workforce. But I'm hopeful that that won't happen. Thanks, Dave. Next question. Next we go to the line of Lee Ross with Fox News. Please go ahead. Hey, Lee. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening. You just mm -hmm. noted that you've had talks with your county counterparts about slowly loosening some restrictions. I'm curious, what do the results of, of today's serology survey mean towards that partial target reopening, which so many want. I mean, so, do the hundreds of thousands of people who've apparently been positive but didn't need to go the, to the hospital speak to an imminent move forward on boosting restrictions, or perhaps just the opposite? Do the numbers or others in the survey suggest to you that, that this loosening isn't quite imminent? Yeah, I, I think it suggests that 95% of us are still vulnerable, more than 95%. And so any moves that we make, we'll have to make very carefully. Uh, we're not going to have people back in their workplaces, sitting next to each other, people hanging out on the beach, playing basketball. Uh, this is not going to happen in the coming days or weeks. But I do believe that as we've seen, there are ways that we can carefully design some small openings of that aperture. But I won't be dreaming that up. I don't have secret negotiations with the county. I just check in every single day with Barbara Ferrer, with my colleagues. I look at places around the world and the country and we look at how we can best do that while protecting lives. We're entering a new phase of this that's gonna be kind of tough, so I wanna take a moment here for everybody listening to explain this. You know, we've done really well. Like, I was really proud to see that 5% or less in the serology test. It means what you have done has worked. And as I've said every single night, if it was working, it would save lives. And that literally means thousands of people are not dead who otherwise would be. I don't even know how to put a price on that. I don't even know how to quantify that. Thank you, like you have been lifesavers. But the irony is those cities that do well 
and adopt these things early on still have a more vulnerable population. Now, don't get me wrong. In New York, where we've seen 10 times, more than 10 times as many deaths uh, per capita, they're still very vulnerable because probably nowhere close to a majority of their city has been exposed to this. So they could do this all over again or two or threefold. So for every city everywhere, just because you've had more people exposed, it doesn't mean, Yahoo, let's all go to work now, um, because we know what that risk is. We've witnessed that. We've seen that in uh, places that are getting refrigerator trucks to deal with the bodies, in emergency rooms where people are deciding who has to live and who has to die. These are excruciating things that we don't want to pat ourselves on the back only a month or two later to say, dang, we should have kept this still pretty tight. That said, we're not gonna stay in this condition forever. What we need to do is manage the infections that will happen and make sure they're always lower than our hospital capacity because that's what will sometimes double the number of deaths. If people can't get into hospital rooms, if there aren't enough ventilators, if we don't have the PPE, if our health workers are getting sick, our firefighters or police officers are getting infected or even dying as we've seen tragically in New York where first responders have died in numbers way above anything that we could imagine here. So I know it's a tough space to contain. People want clear answers. Say, Mayor, tell me what the date is. It's not about a date. It's about building our capacity and trying some steps forward. I'm committed to following that county advice. And I do think that as Dr. Frere has talked about in her briefings, there will be some of those in coming weeks where Maybe there's some more retail that opens up. Maybe there's some distancing. Maybe people can go back to, to the barber. Maybe people can do things, just a few of those things, and get some of our businesses moving. But it won't be an opening of the floodgates overnight. And people who are demanding that are playing with all of our lives. So folks who are saying, open up the country, open up the city, the worst thing we could do would be to lift those floodgates up only to watch all of our friends and neighbors die. So we will balance those two things, contain this, and we'll be committed to building up whatever it is. And I've said what those five principles are. Make sure there's enough testing. Make sure there's the contact tracing so we can track and trace uh, the folks and their contacts. Make sure that we have that quarantining that goes on. Protect our vulnerable populations who may need to stay indoors longer. Keep doing research and development of the medicines and ultimately the vaccine. Uh, and make sure that we're caring for each other. Those things will determine all of those decisions. Thanks, Lee. Next question. Next, we go to the line of Steve Gregory with KFI News. Please go ahead. Hey, Steve. Hey, Eric. Good evening. Listen, a um, couple things. Sure. Uh, the uh, effort to stop evictions for people in the city and the county, does that extend to storage faci facilities and, and storage sheds? And that's something that's been coming up with some of our listeners because that sort of in part and parcel to an extension of someone's home. Also, um, with respect to saving money, has there been any more discussions about those higher paid people within the city taking a pay cut, voluntary or otherwise? And what about discretionary funds on the council side? Has there been any discussion that you're aware of about rerouting some of the discretionary funds from each of the council members? And finally, uh, if you're going to start loosening restrictions, when do you think we can anticipate going back to in-person press conferences? Thanks, Eric. <laughs> sure. Um, I don't know yet. I'll have to take that advice on in-person press conferences, though I will very much look forward to the day that I can uh, look you all in the eye. And I want to thank all the members of the press who have just done an incredible job reporting on this, who show up every night, who ask the great questions, the tough questions, and everybody who broadcasts this. It means the world to Los Angeles so that we can have this conversation between the people and their elected representatives. Um, in terms of council discretionary dollars, those by definition are with the council, but I've been amazed to see them step up and use that to keep restaurants alive and to serve food in places like uh, Marquise Harris Dawson's uh, district and Joe Buscaino's district, um, to see folks uh, like council member Mitch O'Farrell and others look at taking their discretionary dollars to help with rent. Uh, every council member is doing that work and I wanna thank them. So I don't think they're, spent, they're, they're squirreling it away. They're actually putting it out there and spending it on the neediest that we have. Uh, in terms of folks who earn more or less in the city, everybody is uh, represented, so you have to go through each one of those unions. I've tried to lead by example. Um, I hope that others will too, but I know that everybody will get that haircut, and that means folks who earn more will be contributing more back, and folks who earn less will be contributing less, um, because that's the only fair way to, to do it. Um, lastly, uh, eviction to storage facilities, I don't believe that that is covered by the order, is that correct? Um, 
And uh, I, I'll look into that, but I do not believe it applies to storage facilities. It's to your primary residence right now. Yes, I got a nod saying yes, that's correct from my crack staff. All right, next question, please. Our next question comes from the line of Ben Oreskes with LA Times. Please go ahead. Hey, Ben. Hi, Mayor. Thank you for doing this. Um, I, just quickly on the um, rec centers, we haven't talked about them in a couple of days. Sure. Um, I, about 20 are open. Do you plan to open more? Yes. And if so, how many um, we have seen in other cities um, outbreaks, uh, large outbreaks, uh, which have been very concerning? Uh, do you think that we should be opening more of them? So let's be clear about different outbreaks because it's easy to throw them all together. We've seen outbreaks in hotels. We've seen outbreaks in existing uh, shelters. Some of them don't have proper spacing. And uh, this was always based on the advice from our county public health saying, yes, it's better to have folks indoors properly spaced with nurses there, with temperature checks every day, with food, with trailers to isolate and rooms available uh, than it is to have them out on the streets. And it is working exactly how we hoped it would. And I've always said too, that doesn't mean that we will never have cases, but we haven't yet had large scale outbreaks in the city run um, uh, shelters. That said too, uh, we do plan on expanding more. We have another one I think opening tonight or tomorrow and three more this week. So that will add four more and get us to about a thousand beds. At the same time we're moving with the hotel and motel rooms. I've never seen this as an either or. Talking to folks that are in these shelters, so many of them are grateful to have a nurse right there, to have temperature taken, to have PPE around them, to have um, a bed, to have the ability to, if they do get sick, immediately be able to have help and to have food. Um, other folks, that might not appeal to them, but I think the fact that they're 97% filled uh, speaks to the need that was out there in the street long before COVID-19 and now. So I think we will continue as long as it's the advice of LA County Public Health to keep those going. As I mentioned last week, we started opening up the trailers starting in Woodland Hills with the first 14 of the hundreds of trailers that are also available to folks who are experiencing homelessness. I'm proud of that. And then uh, let me give you the latest statistics of the project uh, room key Tier one housing, which is for folks not yet infected, the 700 rooms with 748 guests are occupied in city and county. There's 1,914 rooms secured in the county, uh, 912 of those already operational, and 990 of those rooms are in the city with 472 operational. In our tier two, uh, which is for folks who are already sick, um, 279 rooms are occupied in the city and county, and 900 units are secured, of which 512 are in the city. And I think that might be even um, a day old, because I saw some numbers just before coming in here that showed over 50% filled in both of those. We can't get those fast enough. I'm proud, like I said on Friday, that we're about to sign with a bunch of other ones, and those will go hand in hand with the shelters that we have available. After those three that will open, at the Rec and Parks facilities, we have others that are on the list that we can. We'll look at what the pace of hotels and motels is. If those aren't moving fast enough, we may open more. Thanks, Ben. One other, oh, one, one other thing on, on homelessness. We did move out, as folks might have seen, in Skid Row with Skid Row testing. We stood up a testing facility there today. I think there was 166 tests, if I'm not mistaken. Obviously, we have to wait for those results to come back in the next day or two. That's on top of the hundreds of tests that we've given to um, uh, homeless medical providers uh, who already work with uh, people experiencing homelessness. So that's really starting to, to crank. And I want to thank the Los Angeles Fire Department who stood that up in Skid Row. It was amazing. It was a steady stream of people. And that's going to protect people who are the most vulnerable on the streets. And I think the latest number was 48 people experiencing homelessness uh, have tested positive in the county of Los Angeles. Uh, to put that in perspective, we have, it's a similar number of people who are homeless a little bit less uh, in just LA City than that we have the number of employees and the number of employees that have tested positive for the city of Los Angeles is now 164. So um, shows that that infection rate is even lower than among our city employees, many of whom are on the line and we hope all of them get well soon. Next question, thank you. Next we go to a line of Elizabeth Chow with LA Daily News, please go ahead. Hey Liz. Hi, Mayor. Um, so I wanted to ask your opinion um, on this idea that um, all this doom and gloom about the budget is a bit overblown, not in the sense that um, taking some of these measures are um, not necessary, but 
in the sense that um, the reason that we have all these this unemployment and have uh, business closed is more of a um, intentional move rather than um, a long time developing um, or some some real collapse in the economic um, situation. Um, I was wondering how you feel about that that view. Um, I, I've heard some some good theories over the years, but nothing could be further than the truth. This is about saving lives. None of us invented COVID-19. Nobody looked at the deaths around the world or the cases that are here or the deaths that are in our backyard. Nobody told county public health to recommend to us that we should do these moves to make sure that our lives were saved. This is only in reaction to what we have seen. It is real. Those numbers don't lie. If people think it's different, I certainly didn't tell people single-handedly that they 95% of them should stop flying, that 95% of our hotel rooms shouldn't be booked. That's people protecting their lives, and that is the reality of our receipts. People understand this. People feel this in their own household. Uh, we didn't create this to help to hurt people's households, and we certainly didn't do this to hurt our own city budget. There's nothing I, I care more about than the services that we provide. I've de dedicated my life to that, and every single dollar I could ever find I know what the impact is on the streets of LA. We will safeguard them, protect them, but we also will never BS the public. If we say that this money isn't there, it's because it's not there, and you deserve that truth. We will manage those cuts and at the same time say, we're proud that we have a reserve fund that we are drawing from to make those cuts less severe, to make sure we're not laying off employees. I think I mentioned, I spoke to the mayor of Vancouver, they've already laid off city employees. Think about what that would mean to the economy here locally, let alone to the city services that we depend on. So I'm hoping that we will come back. And I guess the one hopeful thing I'd say to people who are worried about that or to you with the question is this is a snapshot today. A budget isn't a fixed number for an entire year. I said that earlier. I say we're proposing furloughs and we're gonna to need to implement them. That doesn't mean that if the federal government steps up and or the economy comes back, that we wouldn't immediately restore those services and those people because the people of Los Angeles depend on them, let alone those city employees need to feed their families. So this is a snapshot today and this will be the most dynamic budget year in our history. It could get better. It also could, Liz, get worse. And we're gonna have to then look at that and make those cuts. But we will look at it every week and we'll think about that again. We have a two month plan of our expenditures for COVID-19 costs and we have a year-long plan for the expenses around things like homelessness and COVID-19. But those numbers are absolutely real. It is the brutal reality, but it's also one that I'm confident we will march through together. Next question, please. Next, we go to line of Dakota Smith with the LA Times. Please go ahead. Hey, Dakota. Hi, good evening, Mayor. Um, in terms of the furloughs, could you explain, and, and I want to make sure I have this correct, are you imposing furloughs as opposed to negotiating them? Correct. And if so, what, um, what powers do you have to do that, to impose furloughs? Uh, the and city, secondly, no, on the budget that you released today, does your budget assume a complete reopening in a specific month um, in the next year, in the next fiscal year? No, I think this budget will be open all the time. There's not a formal reopening, but we're going to be, as I said, looking at it week by week. Um, it will be that dynamic based on uh, what state and federal assistance there is, whether people are traveling, what receipts we get in. It won't, we won't even need to think about a formal reopening. We're going to be looking at this much more dynamically and every day, every week, every month throughout the year. Uh, furloughs are in our power. We imposed them in 2009 uh, after the 2008 crash. That was something we need to do. We do need to sit down and speak with our labor partners about them, but that's one area where we don't need the approval. But like I said, I'm open to anything on the table, um, but we need to save those dollars now. We can't have less money in our budget than we need to spend on protecting people, on ensuring that they're fed, on making sure that we continue forward with critical services. So that's something we had to do then. It is in the city charter power, and it's something that we are not um, asking for, we are imposing. But I, I don't wanna be, uh, by the way, um, cavalier about that. I know what that sacrifice is like for city employees. It's shared by us and it's shared by everybody in the city. And I remain hopeful that throughout this year, if it gets better, it doesn't have to be the entire year. But if it doesn't get better, that will be how we partially balance this budget. Next question, please. Thanks. Next, we go to a line of Michael Blood with Associated Press. Please go ahead. Hey, Michael. Hello, Mayor. 
Um, you've described a very grim economic outlook for the coming year, but your budget projects that city revenues will increase by about 2%. I'm wondering if you could discuss why such severe budget steps are needed, including thousands of furloughs and, and virtually across the board budget cuts, when you'll have more money next year than this year. So remember the money that comes in is mostly been collected during this year for us to spend in this coming year. So most of that came before COVID-19. We don't know for sure, that's a projection and it could obviously get worse, but we're budgeting with what we think is a semi-optimistic look at our revenues, but a realistic one as well. Um, that comes from all sorts of things. Um, our commitment to fight homelessness means that we put more and more money into that, and that's a commitment that we have. Uh, when we look at just the cost of living increases that come, that is something that happens every single year. So in other words, the expenses that we have brought on by COVID-19, brought on by normal inflation, and brought on by the areas where we're expanding and making sure that our core services around the things that people need um, are there. That's what drives that we have more than 2% costs and we have only an increase of 2%. So that's where our cuts come from. And I know that's tough for folks to kind of wrap their head around, but it's like a household. You can have 2% more come, more come into your household, but that doesn't mean that it keeps up with your costs. And for all of us, we've, I think, done a very good job of not only keeping up with costs, but putting money into the reserves. But part of the way we're balancing that is by taking from those reserves that have built up over time. So I know there was a more in-depth uh, phone conversation with our CAO and my deputy uh, chief of staff, Matt Sabo, earlier today. And we're happy to follow on on some of the nitty gritty as to why. But that's not unique to Los Angeles. That's every single city that we see out there. Um, and we are expecting, by the way, there's some revenues that actually go up. But at the same time, other ones go down. Uh, Los Angeles is always better insulated than some places that are looking at 20 and 40 percent cuts to the revenue because they depend on one source like income tax or sales tax. And when the stock market's down, that hits income taxes. When something like this hits, that hits sales tax. But we have a balancing of a lot of different uh, resources that helps us be healthier than most. Thanks, Michael. Next question, please. Our last two questions will be in Spanish. Uh, we go to the line of Denora Perez with Telemundo. Please go ahead. Hi, Denora. Hi, Mayor. Um, I'm interested in asking you in regards to the furlough, and the furlough cuts will uh, be saving money for the city, but how much money are you uh, estimating that is needed from the federal government to help Los Angeles? And then also, if we do have more than one shelter-in-place order in the future, you had mentioned the possibility of two or even three, can there be more furlough cuts in the future until we actually see a vaccine? Um, so the furlough uh, order that we have in place, it saves us, how much is it about? 140, 140 million um, from our general fund. Because remember, not everybody is furloughed. There's some people who are critical city services who we can't afford to furlough. Um, we need them to answer 911 calls, to pick up the trash, um, but they're you know, fewer uh, than you'd think, fewer departments than you'd think. Police, fire, sanitation, and some critical employees and others. So it's 140 million. We aren't bouncing the budget today on the expectation of more furloughs. And I think as you begin to do that, that begins to take away so many city services that we have to ask whether the city can function. A lot of that will also depend on what is open. If county public health says, go ahead and open libraries, that's going to be a lot of librarians back at work doing things and making sure that they can serve the public. Um, are our rec and parks facilities going to be open? Is our zoo going to reopen? All of those different city employees in different departments, it'll depend on that. But we are not planning as of today, and like I said, each one of these is a snapshot on any fur uh, further furloughs. Um, and the first half was, uh, I think, on shelter in place. What? Sorry, we, lo we lost $230 million in revenues over the last month due to COVID-19. So that's what we uh, put as the projections of how much money we have lost during this period of time. So that, también en español, uh, yo quiero decir, um, estos cortes son una pintura del presupuesto ahora. Pero espero con la ayuda del gobierno federal, necesitamos um, ahora uh, cerca de 300 millones de dólares del gobierno federal para prevenir más cortes, para ayudar a nuestros trabajadores en, el ciudad, en la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Y yo estoy 
luchando muy duro obtener estos fondos. La uh, proposición, el presupuesto de um, uh, Speaker Pelosi y uh, Senador uh, Schumer es 100, uh, 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 50 mil de millones de dólares para nuestros estados y nuestras ciudades. Y nuestras ciudades son el corazón de la comunidad, del país, y necesitamos a tener esta ayuda, no solamente por los bancos grandes, las corporaciones, pero también por la gente en nuestras ciudades, especialmente porque nuestros trabajadores están luchando en las líneas frentes de esta lucha, los bomberos, los médicos, Uh, los hospitales, las personas en nuestros hospitales, uh, merecemos estos fondos porque estamos uh, uh, el grupo uh, de trabajadores que están salvando las vidas de americanos. In English, I, I forgot to add that too. We probably need at least that much money, $270 million dollars from the federal government just to replenish what was lost this past month. But what was put on the table was $150 billion for all the states and cities combined. If that came in, I'm not sure what LA City's portion would be, but it would go a large way to restoring critical services that people depend on, to making sure that people weren't furloughed, that people don't you know, lose their jobs, to make sure that we actually can keep our economy going, and that the services that people deserve with their tax dollars come back to the cities where they live. Thank you. Next question. Our last question for tonight will be from Victor Cordero with Estrella Channel 62. Please go ahead. Hola, Victor. Alcalde, ¿qué tal? Muy buenas tardes. I'm going to ask you in English and then I'll try to do it really quick in Spanish. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry to be persistent. I'm going to ask you something and I want to see if you can help me a little bit with a little more specific question. I know it's kind of hard, but it's my job. Uh, every time I go out on the streets, I see more and more people uh, trying to take advantage of uh, the no rent situation, not paying rent. And now, with a Friday, um, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar proposed the idea of not paying rent or the mortgages on the, the houses and uh, for one or two or three months uh, for as long as this lasts, and then at the end just forget about it and just keep on going. Um, my question to you, what kind of protection there are for the uh, uh, small people, the small uh, uh, individual who has one or two houses, right. or veterans in this case, who happen to have a house or two, and they rent, and, and that is the only income that they yeah. have. I'm going to ask it in Spanish really quick. Por Alcalde, supuesto. gracias. Sí, y perdón que sea tan persistente, pero es mi trabajo. Um, le he preguntado un par de veces y me gustaría ver si hay una respuesta un poco más concisa en cuanto al hecho de que mucha gente tal mm. vez no puede pagar la renta por la situación, se entiende. Sin embargo, ¿qué hacemos con estas personas que tienen una o dos casas? O los veteranos, por ejemplo, que tienen una o dos casas y su único ingreso son las rentas. ¿Qué servicios se puede ofrecer? ¿Qué protección hay para ellos? Sobre todo cuando la página de internet que usted ha dado, the web page that you have supplied, uh, sometimes the people tell me that it's not working, it's not helping. A veces no les ayuda. So thank you, uh, Victor, for the question. I'll answer it in English and then Spanish, and then I'll give my remarks for this evening in Spanish. So it's a really, really good point you bring up. If we don't have relief for both renters and for those kind of small landlords out there simultaneously, we'll add to poverty in multiple ways and the system will collapse. Um, I always say if you can pay rent, pay your rent. If you can pay some of your rent, pay some of your rent. But anybody who can't pay any of their rent, they will not be evicted. But it's one of the reasons that I, and they will have 12 months to pay that back. But it's one of the reasons I called on and I support, whether it's Representative Omar's uh, legislation or anything out there. I said in my state of the city address, the federal government should give direct cash assistance to help both renters and mortgage holders to have assistance in having a couple months or however long this lasts, assistance. If we're giving money to banks, we should give uh, that one of the conditions is that they let mortgage holders have a month or two of relief, that that has to be passed on to renters as well. Because people don't have jobs, they can't pay the rent, they don't have the savings. So it is, I think, something that hopefully will be a movement that continues to grow. I 100% support it. We have the strongest you know, rent protections in the country, but do I think they're strong enough? Of course not. But would it be fair to just say, everybody don't pay your rent, and as you said, mom and pops, uh, lose their house, lose their mortgage. The banks claim that from them when these are veterans, working class folks, immigrants, and that's all they have. I'm absolutely sympathetic to both of those 
uh, classes of folks who are working class who don't have much money. Este es muy importante y gracias por esta pregunta, porque necesitamos ayuda por los inquilinos y los dueños. Uh, es importante a tener asistencia fiscal del gobierno federal y yo apoyo la legislación de congresista Omar y otras que quieren a uh, traer recursos directamente, no solamente a las corporaciones grandes, a los bancos, pero una condición de esta asistencia, por ejemplo, a los bancos, debe ser asistencia a los dueños y una condición de la asistencia de estos dueños es asistencia por nuestros inquilinos. Estamos juntos y la relación entre un inquilino y un dueño es crítico. Y muchas veces hay veteranos, hay uh, inmigrantes, personas que dependen en este, esta renta. Viceversa, hay mucha gente que no tiene trabajos y necesitamos un hogar. Tenemos la ley más generosa en los Estados Unidos, 10 meses para pagar su renta, uh, un desalojo uh, en evicciones, pero es, uh, uh, hay una... Uh, Sí, desalojo, no hay desalojos en, en la ciudad, pero también necesitamos a, a, a tener ayuda por los dos lados, porque sin esto, este sistema no trabaja. Gracias por esta pregunta. Thank you to everybody who has tuned in tonight, who will be tuning out maybe as I speak uh, Spanish. Thank you for your strength. I'll see you tomorrow. Keep with it. We will get through this. Muy buenas tardes, Los Ángeles. Gracias por venir a la alcaldía. Anoche les presenté mi discurso sobre el estado de nuestra ciudad. Hoy estamos cansados y tristes, pero este desafío no ha logrado quebrar nuestro espíritu. Saldremos adelante y estaremos juntos otra vez. Ahora les comparto los datos de hoy. Hoy hubieron mil 491 nuevos casos en el condado de Los Ángeles, llegando a un total de 13,816 casos de COVID-19. Es un nuevo récord. En la ciudad tuvimos 716 nuevos casos, llegando a un total de 6,224. Hoy fallecieron 17 personas más en el condado llegando a un total de 617 y tenemos, eh, tuvimos más de 80 fallecieron en sábado, un récord nuevo también. Lo siento a las familias por su sufrimiento y somos contigo, estamos contigo, nuestros corazones, nuestras oraciones, nuestros sentimientos. Este virus ha matado a más de 1,800 americanos cada día. Es la mayor causa de muerte en nuestra nación. Por eso estamos haciendo todo lo posible para apoyar a nuestros hospitales. Y en buenas noticias, nuestros hospitales tenemos 1,572 camas disponibles. Entre ellas, 272 están en unidades de cuidados intensivos y tenemos 1,040 respiradores disponibles. Hoy abrimos tres sitios nuevos para hacer pruebas y ahora tenemos 33 sitios en la ciudad y el condado, incluyendo un sitio uh, hospital de Good Samaritan, el lugar de mi nacimiento. Tenemos capacidad de hacer pruebas para 12,000 personas al día y al final del día hoy hemos hecho pruebas a más de 80,000 personas en estos sitios con los otros laboratorios y hospitales, más de 100,000 personas han recibido un, una prueba. Si tienes síntomas, puede hacer una cita para una prueba en la página coronavirus.lacity.org diagonal testing. Y por favor, toma una prueba. Si tú tienes síntomas um, no severas, aún es importante a tener una prueba, a proteger su familia y las personas en su hogar y, y en su vecindario. Cada noche he, he hablado sobre el gran impacto que ha tenido esta crisis 
y cómo ha destruido vidas y subsistencia para todos. En un instante ha desaparecido el crecimiento económico, reemplazado por el miedo y la incertidumbre. Igualmente, esta crisis ha tenido un impacto en nuestro presupuesto municipal, tanto en las inversiones como en el, los servicios que podemos ofrecer de ahora en adelante. Desde que empezó esta crisis, nuestros ingresos ya han bajado y la estimación de los ingresos para el año entrante ha bajado por más de 230 millones de dólares. Esto significa que tendremos que tomar decisiones muy difíciles. Los Ángeles tomó acción inmediata contra la pandemia y esta acción tuvo un impacto en nuestro presupuesto. Le he dirigido a los departamentos a cortar lo más posible y en el año que viene la Fuerza Laboral Municipal implementará un horario de trabajo reducido con un corte salarial de 10%. Sin embargo, les prometo que no vamos a comprometer las cosas que son más importantes en esta ciudad, como los servicios públicos esenciales y nuestra seguridad pública. Esto lo podemos hacer porque hemos ahorrado para establecer una fundación financiera estable. Este presupuesto anticipa que los impactos económicos de esta pandemia continuarán durante los años que vienen y es necesario preservar los fondos de reserva que tenemos. Pero aún necesitamos el apoyo del gobierno federal, no solo para apoyarnos económicamente, sino para también ayudarnos en mantener empleos y brindar servicios críticos a la gente de Los Ángeles. Estoy agradecido a nuestros socios en el gobierno federal por aprobar la remuneración de ciertos gastos relacionados a, esto, a esta crisis. Y ahora nuestro Congreso debe aprobar la propuesta para proporcionar 150 mil millones de dólares para presupuestos estatales y locales en el próximo paquete de estímulo económico. Por favor, necesitamos su ayuda. Y la gente de América vive en nuestros estados y ciudades. Necesitamos su ayuda inmediatamente. Hoy también estoy orgulloso de anunciar una nueva colaboración con la corporación Fox para proporcionar comidas gratis para personas discapacitadas en nuestra ciudad. Esta iniciativa entregará a 2,000 comidas cinco días a la semana durante el mes entrante para personas con obstáculos al acceso a la alimentación en esta crisis. Gracias a todos por su generosidad y amor para continuar en la lucha contra el coronavirus. Entonces, quédense en buena salud, quédense protegidos, quédense en casa. Mucha fuerza y mucho amor, Los Ángeles. Hasta mañana. Thank you all. Have a good evening.